Hi everyone, my name is Deborah Stoll. I am the content producer for MM&M's custom team. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Level X webinar, Game-Changing Approaches to Reaching and Engaging HCPs. The video which you just saw was a world premiere, never before seen. It was a sneak preview of a new mechanism of action solution Level X is launching in the coming weeks. And with me today to explore how Level X's neuroscience-based game mechanics are helping a new generation of providers navigate and overcome barriers to patient care and improve health outcome outcomes. Health outcomes are Dr. Eric Gantworker, VP and Medical Director of Level X, Dr. Gantworker, a practicing academic pedi pediatric ENT surgeon leads Level X's medical and educational strategy, directs CME and product development, oversees efficacy studies, and manages the company's robust physician advisory board. His specialty, applying the cognitive science of learning, motivational theory, and educational technology to medical education, has him in great demand as a national and international speaker. We also have with us Jason Vandenberg, game design director for Level X, Jason employs game design methodologies honed through extensive experience in the consumer games industry to capture the greatest challenges of medical and surgical procedures as video game mechanics. He has worked on nearly every aspect of third and first person action game design for things like Call of Duty, X-Men, James Bond, Lord of the Rings, and he also developed Engines of Play, a model of player motivation used across the industry to optimize game design. And last but not least, we have Dr. Shraddha Desai, Director of Cosmetic and Laser Surgery at DePage Medical Group Dermatology and Adjunct, Pro Adjunct Professor of Dermatology at Loyola University Medical Center. Dr. Desai is a board certified dermatologist at the Dermatology Institute in Naperville and holds an adjunct professorship at Loyola University in Maywood, Illinois. Dr. Desai has also written several journal articles and book chapters and has presented at national meetings. Now, in order to set the stage for our discussion, I want to just give a brief overview of Level X. Level X creates medical video games and learning experiences that accelerate awareness, education, and adoption using state-of-the-art video game technology and cognitive neuroscience to capture the challenges of practicing medicine. The games can be played on phones, they can be played on tablets and web browsers, browsers, and they're helping to revolutionize the way medical professionals advance their clinical skills, earn CME, and keep up to speed on cases, medical devices, drug therapies, and clinical best practices. Currently, Level X games are being played by more than 750,000 healthcare professionals, including those in the top 20 pharmaceutical and medical device companies, national medical societies and government organizations, including NASA. So that's a pretty decent bunch of people you wanna try and emulate if, if you're, you know, if you're looking for some education. So let's start with some basics to help us understand how Level X was first created. Shraddha, is it, uh, is it okay if I call you by your first name? Oh no. It might be on a slight time delay here. Yeah. Um, Shrad, I wanted to ask you how you got involved with Level X. Hi, uh, thank you so much. You can call me Shraddha, and I 
apologize ahead of the ahead of time just because my connection seems to be a little off today. Um, I was first approached by Level X through LinkedIn, and you're probably wondering what a dermatologist wants to do with a gaming company, but. Um, I've always loved video games. I'm a child of the 80s, so I grew up on them. I had the original Atari. Um, and my brother is an animator for a gaming company as well. And so growing up, I used to enjoy going to see him at work and basically see all the intricate details that go into game making. This gave me a opportunity to um, kind of combine two things that I really enjoy. So it was kind of a no-brainer for me. Um, as part of his advisor for Level X, I get to participate in content as well as help with artistic partners. So it's been really exciting for me. Cool. cool. And uh, Eric, how about you? How did you first get involved with Level X? Yeah, so after I finished my clinical training, I actually got a master's in medical education, and my specific focus was on motivational theory, cognitive science of learning, and educational technology, including games. And I was approached by Sam, the CEO at the time, to come on as an advisor and a, as a subject matter expert. I grew up playing games with my brother, who's also a physician, and you know this was a pretty interesting opportunity and a good use of my skill sets that I just developed and wanted to foster. So so I got involved initially as a subject matter expert and advisor, just like Dr. Desai, and then really kind of evolved into sort of a, a leading uh, advisor across multiple specialties, and then eventually the medical director since uh, 2018. And really, it's been a great use of my my skill sets, and really would love uh, love what we do, and uh, believe that it's sort of the future. And working with people like Jason is really what gets me excited every day. <laughs> Jason, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> uh, I paid him five bucks to say nice things about me. Five dollars. I thought it was seven fifty. It's really cheap. It's really. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm Jason Vanberg, so I've, I've, I've been working in video games for about 25 years now. Um, and uh, I, I started, you know, I, 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 was a, I was someone who had a very broad interest um, in my schooling about, you know, entertainment and technology and psychology and history and all that. Um, and it, it ended up all sort of honing into this, this um, wonderful entertainment science of uh of, of interactive interactivity and, and technology, um, and so uh, I brought uh, I did I did uh, you know twenty year stint making big exciting you know um, big budget games. It was a super blast. Um, it it was it was a, a heady time. I was part of the we, uh, during during the course of my career. I watched the industry go from like people in garage you know garages with a couple of thousand you know a couple thousand people around the world making video games to where it is now, where a lot of people don't know it's a it's a you know twenty or thirty billion dollar industry industry with you know we employ hundreds of thousands of people my my last big project was you know 400 400 people and we were in, in, in that studio we were the small team right there was there's teams now that are 2,000 3,000 people that are making these huge games um, you know it's 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 become this massive massive thing it used to be a time where where uh, we would go to talk to college students and we would ask them, have you played a video game? And about 10 years ago, we stopped doing that because there's no such thing as a college yeah. student that doesn't play video games now. They don't exist. Um, so it's it's been really fun to sort of be part of that, watching games become a ubiquitous part of the culture. Um, and then, you know, uh, having having sort of done the big exciting arc that was a lot of fun, uh, I started to turn my attention to, you know, my mom was a nurse. Uh, so I grew up around around uh, hospitals and was always part of the, you know, she's also a, a type 1 diabetic. So it was, we had, you know, you would hospital care at home um uh, and so i've always always was interested in the body and all of this and so um when i started to think to myself you know is there is there a way i could do more can i you know can i bring this to you know bring the, what i've learned and have a more direct impact direct, direct positive impact on culture um that was i ran into level x i met sam just like you eric um sam is a incredibly compelling uh leader and the more i looked at this company i was like i gotta i gotta give this a try it's an opportunity to push game design even further and to, to see if we can um, really take the the lessons of human motivation and learning and, and, and training and also entertainment and joy, that fusion that happens in video games and bring them to uh, a whole new industry that is in, in constant need of learning. Right? Medical, the medical industry is, in, it, there's, a, there's an endless supply, an infinite supply of people who need to learn things real fast right now, right? Um, so yeah. it's, a, it's, it's an exciting time. 
Yeah, it's such a dynamic, diverse group of things that go into creating games at Level X. So I, I want to discuss the benefits of, of using games for learning and engagement. Because um, I think a lot of people like myself, when you think about learning, I'll reach for a book or maybe I'll watch a TED Talk and video games don't necessarily come to the, to the front of mind. And so, Jason, I, I think I'd like to ask you first, um, and then maybe Eric can weigh in, how do games actually facilitate learning and support active learning recall? Right. I mean, uh, it's a great question. And it, it, it's, it's a wonderful time to be, we're learning all about this now, right? Um, and what's cool is that the, we are now in an era where we've done a lot of studies on this. Um, there's, a, there's actually real science um, that, that supports the, the, the benefits. And so we know that interact, interactive learning, basically interactive learning sort of across the board performs much better in terms of retention, you know, sort of recall overall. So why? The theory that we have, that we, that we operate is, um, I, I, I call it um, uh, sort of the, the lean back experience experience versus a lean forward experience when you're when you're receiving a lecture or like like our audience here today hello audience <laughs> I hope you're having a good time right you guys are in a kind of lean back situation right where you're receiving information um, and when the brain is in that mode it, it, it is you're, you're receptive but there's a there's a sort of a, a filtering process where your, your brain is collecting information it seems and then later you process that into learning um, and and it, it there's sort of a multi-step process what we find is that when when players when we introduce the concept of play people set forward and they start to take control or they introduce agency into the experience and people start to be able to control their own experience and what happens is a whole other part of the brain takes control it's the part that makes models in the brain right and that part starts to test theories actively while they are being learned and that seems to make far more robust models, and it seems to mean that those models um, uh, last a lot longer in the brain. So that's our current theory. Of course, no one's getting there. We're not doing, you know, we don't know how to do the MRI scans and figure out exactly how it works, but that's the, <laughs> That is, that is the operating theory, and it seems to be true. It seems to be true. So the, the goal in design is for us to create an experience that that allows the player to sort of feel a sense of agency and power, to lean forward, take control of their own experience. And then once they start to take control of their own experience, they'll start to control their own learning and follow their own curiosity, which leads to better outcomes. It's like a video version of Choose Your Own Adventure. Precisely. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. Cool. You remember the, you remember the choices you make in those books, right? Literally, yeah. 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 I remember those. Yeah, I mean, you know, the things that I'll add is is you know, in medicine we we learn a lot of things, right? And so we know the doubling time of medical information is about 73 days. That means the entire corpus of medical information is doubling every 73 days. It is impossible for a graduate of a program today to know everything they ever need to know. Instead, they really focus on how to process information and really what we do is, you know, there's the old learn 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 see do, or, or see one do one teach one, um, which we know is not not quite right, but there is that idea that Jason was talking about that trial and error that, you know, that kid dropping the ball to see how gravity works and seeing if you'll pick it up. Uh, uh, a hundred times. You know, kids put things in their mouth, they're exploring, and so trying things out is really integral to us as humans and learning. And stories are very integral as well, and so video games really offer that pretty obvious, like trial and error is what games are, you know? You try to get extra lives, you go through and this through this trial and error process to try and learn and, and abstract experiences, conceptualize, and then try to test those theories. And, and doing that in a lecture, you can't do that right? The other thing that games really achieve is something called a flow state, which I think a lot of people have achieved. Um, it was a, a psychologist named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi that really coined the term, and really he was looking I'm at, at so elite athletes. I'm so impressed you say that. So <laughs> I know. He's, uh, I, I practice a lot. It helps that his first name and the end of his last name are the same. Um, so, but, uh, so basically what, he, what he, he witnessed this in elite athletes and obviously in um, high, high achieving musicians musicians who really hyper focus and are super concentrating. I think a lot of surgeons, a lot of physicians have been in these states. We've seen kids who play their video games until two in the morning, have no idea where time went. And that is really that flow state that you can actually achieve within games. But that is not by happenstance. 
that is deliberately designed within the game to try and achieve that flow state. And the important thing is, is you're so concentrated, you're so dialed in, you're very task specific and goal oriented. And that is actually the most efficient learning that you can ever have. And that's why games have this magic, this design experience to try and bring people in and have them learn through this flow state uh, achievements. Yeah, the flow state is such a key so thing. Go ahead. Sorry, Shrada. Sorry, sorry, Deb. <laughs> um, oh, I was just ahead. saying, he just put that so eloquently. And for me, the first thing I think about is, you know, when I'm in a lecture, I just, I, I fall asleep. Like if someone's talking at me, it's not helpful at all. Um, I need to engage and playing a game is is fun and exciting. And, and you, I do learn better just from personal experience, just to share that. Yeah, and we know absolutely. we know that um, the last thing I'll add is that we know that memory and emotion are very strongly tied to each other. If you have a very emotional experience, you'll uh, have a very strong memory imprint of it. In medicine, we used to use this idea of pimping in medicine because uh, it basically was a activating moment where people put you on the spot to answer questions. We know pimping is actually not a really good experience because it's activating, but it's a negative activating. You still will remember if somebody put you on the spot and you didn't know the answer, you went to the library, you looked it up and you found the answer. And that's why sort of the old, the old guard thinks that it works very well. But instead, games live in this activated and happy space, which again is activating and allows them to have a much better emotional experience, a remarkable experience that helps with that memory tie and the retention and recall. So interesting. So, so, so off of that, like, what are the specific benefits of learning for HCP, HCPs uh, through video games? You know, so how does specifically to HCPs, how does actively playing a game impact their practice or behavior? Maybe, uh, maybe Shrada, you can start and then we can go to Eric. Well, I think one of the most important things to remember is that doctors play video games. I think there's this misconception that all we do is go home and work on charts and that's it and we have no fun. Um, but we do love to play video games and we will find the time to do so. Um, you, you know, for confirm. me specifically, you can that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. exactly. um, I can speak <laughs> towards top derm because that's one I've played. Um, and what how I think it can really help us is there's a lot of knowledge in there that I don't maybe get on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, I, um, I really hate reading journals. I fall asleep the moment I open one up and I'm like, if you want me to go to sleep, give me a journal to read. Um, and I do still need to know a lot of things. Obviously technology is changing. Medicine is changing. How we approach different things continues to change as well. And, um, I'm more of a um, surgical as well as cosmetic dermatologist, but there's still things medically that I need to know. And I think learning that from a game not only is going to give me, um, you know, the up to date knowledge, but also it's going to give me the retention um, to keep that in my mind moving forward. Because at the end of the day, I still have to take my boards, whether I do medical dermatology or not. And if I have a fun way to do it, you know, that's going to help me moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's Eric. that's the way we can reimagine the way that people engage with information is really kind of what makes me excited about Level X. I mean, when we were back in medical school, you know, Sharada can attest to this, like doing question banks sort of felt like a game. Um, it was a very terrible game, but we played <laughs> them, and right? And we went through like thousands. I remember sitting on the train studying for my boards and I had an app with literally just trivia question or really just boards questions and answering them and reading them. And like every single day I commuted and you know, there, there you still were given sort of points and interesting things about it, but it really, it wasn't sort of necessarily a game, but we definitely feel like we can learn that way. And that's sort of like the flashcard mentality, um, which is actually uh, does actually show uh, positive learning outcomes. Um, um, but, you know, the other thing to think about games is that they're an opt-in experience. You know, Jason's talking about 20 to $30 billion industry. It's actually, I think, uh, supposedly over the next five years, supposed to reach $200 billion. Yeah. And the reason why is because games are an opt-in experience. Yeah. People are intrinsically motivated to play games, which means if you're bored or it's too challenging, you're not going to play the game and that game is not going to sell. Yeah. And so they are yeah. masters at 
tapping into this intrinsic motivation to have you keep going. There's lots of different techniques that Jason can talk about later um, and how they do this, but that is the way that we can take something like a journal article where people are falling asleep or a con exactly, or a conference where people are falling asleep and change it to be okay, you want to be here, you want to keep going, you're interested in keep going, and the experience is pulling you in as opposed to us pushing you into the experience. Right. I would add, I would add too, like, the, 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 there's a point that's emerging in what you guys are saying that is worth pointing out. If you're bored with something, like if you're like, like you know, Shrata, when you're, when you're sitting there thinking about journal, how do I get, get through all of these journals? One of the techniques that humans just come up with on their own is I'm going to turn this into a game for myself. Like I'm just going to, mm -hmm. so I'm going to just do three, mm -hmm. give myself a set of rules and I'm going to try to hit this goal and then I'm going to like Absolutely. time it and I'm going to rush <laughs> and then like, like games, ga we think it, it Often in culture, we think of games as like this thing, this external thing that we take and then we do this this behavior. But actually, games are a deeply human behavior. We naturally play when we're looking for ways to get through the harder parts of life. So I think it's I think it's um, uh, it's just important to remember that 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 what we're talking about here is not not necessarily asking a player to do something that they wouldn't do normally. We're just trying to unlock the natural spirit of play that lives inside the mind. Um, and that was it's craving um, stimulation in order to facilitate its own learning. Literally, games date yeah. back thousands of years. Senate, there was a, a, a Senate was one of the first board games, and it was found when Jason Senate was found like oh. a thousand BC or something. Probably, yeah, 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 a thousand BC, two thousand. Really? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, a thousand, we've been yeah, tag. absolutely. We've been playing tag since long before that. Like you know, we've been insane. You know, game, games, yeah. games, games, games probably predate um, you know language, right? So yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> Well, it seems related to how they say um, sports and music, which you were, you were mentioned before, when kids are given those access to those in school, they do much better in school because they retain information differently, right? Like if you're bad at math, but you're good at, you're into music, you can understand theory and you can understand math from that. You know, you're, everybody's brains are more interested when something dynamic is happening. And the, yeah. the other thing that magically happens off of what you're saying, Deborah, is the idea of mastery. So the thing that comes together with musicians and elite athletes and physicians is the idea of trying to achieve mastery. And when you're trying to achieve mastery, your motivations are totally different. And that's why elite athletes are elite athletes. So that's why Olympians are Olympians, because they're trying to achieve mastery. And in medicine, we've sort of gone the competency route, but you see a lot yeah. of um, schools now trying to change the language from just being competent physician to trying to achieve mastery and that is a mindset and a perspective change that we need to do in medicine that games have already tried to achieve right that already achieve organically not even through the game design but organically through the players Super it is some work though it's hard it's, <laughs> yeah. not, it's not as easy as he makes it we sound. can't all uh, be masters <laughs> as, as jason does. yeah right masters. <laughs> yeah, speaking of mastery <laughs> So speaking of mastery, neuroscience is a huge part of every level X game. And neuroscience has grown leaps and bounds in recent years. And the extent to which we're able to understand the neural roots of human behavior, consciousness, and memory have helped fields, you know, mathematics, linguistics, engineering, computer science, medicine. So I'm interested to understand what aspects and theories of neuroscience underlie the games that you create, and and maybe uh, Jason, you can you can kick us off with this one. Sure. Um, so um, my specialty, of course, is more on the sort of the motivational, sort of psychological part, the biochemistry part. I'll definitely um, leave that to leave that to Eric to to explain. Good luck with that. Um, uh, <laughs> but also, um, what I found so I. I I, I was I've been interested in psychology from you know from the beginning really and as a game developer um, I had this strange experience where I, I, I early on in my career I, th I thought to myself well we are living we're we're trying to solve motivation like we really need to understand human motivation so what we should do is we should go to the universities and the ivory towers and we should go and ask the people who are doing these studies to help us like we should bring in specialists and and sort of receive the training from the from the from the sort of the pillars of you know the, from the from places of learning and and because there's there's, there's lots of strong theories out there. And what we found, so we went to universities, what we found is that universities at that time had been studying us for 10 years already. That in fact, 
in fact, most of the hard data on on um, what caused people to be motivated to 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 do certain types of things or whatever was all based on studying game play behavior um, and studying the games industry for techniques and I was it was astonishing it was an astonishing moment to kind of realize that that we had been being we had been being mined for the I mean, they were and then they did of course had good theories like it wasn't you know they, they had then organized those ideas into cool thoughts about there's several theories around like the big five personality um, structure has been very very useful there's this thing called self-determination theory which is the the baseline of every um, important thing the that's bedrock it, of motivation the bedrock of all the motiva motivation theory it okay. states that states that there's three core motivations that that, that we want that we to, to for our life to feel valuable worthwhile like for our time to feel like it is something that we are that we will look back on fondly and you know will be that, that we would think was a good use of our time that we would we need these three things or two of these three things um uh, and it's a uh, uh, autonomy which is the ability to make choices for yourself and sort of be self-determined um relatedness is which is which is knowing where you are in the social sphere and having you know uh, understanding your your where where you fit in with your people and having you know be able to predict your social responses accurately and then mastery which is the or, or competence right um uh, they say confidence but it should be mastery <laughs> yeah it should be mastery it should be mastery exactly um uh, they're all mastery as it turns out um, but so that that self-determination theory turns out to be um when we when we the the great thing about it is that it's been around since the 70s there's a huge amount of studies that have been done um that that um allow us to allow allowed us in the games industry to sort of show up and pick you know sort of take these tests and the science that have been sort of being developed in the in the in the universities and the institutions and then just apply them directly to our games and what we discovered is there the the Self-determination theory, the, the aspects of self-determination theory are the only the factors that predict not necessarily what people, whether people will be playing like in an hour, but whether people will buy your game again, that they would buy the sequel, um, which is the strongest indicator that they really had a good, that they felt you like your game was worthwhile, right? Because um, if, you, if you played a game and then, you know, three years later, you buy the second one. You got something out of it, right? Like it was, it was, it was worthy, right? Um, uh, and it turns out that if you have two, at least two of these F SDT motivations out of the, out of the three, um, that that is that 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 is what the what predicts that um, uh, sort of accurately, um, and nothing else. It turns out you can't. What, what's fun about play too is that you can't, you can't. I, I spent a lot of time, spent a lot of time in my, um, my my earlier career explaining to like marketing people and business execs and like the folks that are like like running the businesses um, that we can't force people to play these games. Like we really have to create something that offers them a genuine good exchange for their time. There, it's optional. Right, um, and so with, what I love about game design is that there's no way to fake it. It, it if it's fun pe and rewarding, people will play it, and if it's it not fun and rewarding, isn't. they yeah. won't. Like they just won't. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's it's hard facts. Like at the end of the day, it's a, it is an art form, but it's an art form with a very clear scientific outcome. <laughs> Players enjoyed it or they didn't. Um, uh, yeah. And you can't and you can't argue with them. You can't go like, well, you uh, I worked really hard on that. You should enjoy it. Right? Um, <laughs> Not, that's not how it works. Um, so, in terms of that's that's the that's the, there's a, there are lots and lots of theories, and we live in a we live in a wonderful era. Of course, the MRI has has opened up the world of the mind, right? Um, and so we have we live in a we live in a golden age of expanding theories of psychology and and uh, um, uh, but it 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 still all sort of rests on the bedrock of SDT. Yeah, interesting. Uh, and and I'll just do a quick add on, you know, and and you know, uh, we also found working at Level X that doctors don't know how to define fun, um, and I realized that nobody, really does. nobody knows nobody. nobody does knows how to define it's fun. A terrible word. It just it's a terrible you word. you know it when you see it. Um, and so somebody asked me a long time ago, um, how do you define a, a how do you define an experience as whether it's a game or not? And my answer was, did you have fun? And they said, yes. I was like, then it was a game. Yeah, you know, like, you know, this basically it's like that that's how you, because they're like, hey, what's the difference between a simulation and a game? And I said, did you have fun doing the simulation? Not really. Then that wasn't a game. 
you know, like that's, you know, it's a pretty simple <laughs> definition. Um, mm. So, but, you know, really, really what we talk about the neuroscience and, and Jason brought up the fMRI was, you know, we really, really understand where the reward centers are in the brain and really some of the games that really foster that experience where you're going to have dopamine release and all the neurotransmitters that really are, are concentrated in the reward center are really why, how Angry Birds has these big explosions, why sound effects and video effects have made their way into every single game game experience, right? And you can even see from our trailer at the beginning, you can definitely see the way that sort of your neural transmitters are going off as things like explode and you see all this stuff dying off and then you see this other stuff spreading, right? That's all this deep neural neural transmitter experience, this emotion that you're experiencing. We talked about emotion and memory and how important it is, but that reward center is so important when you're going through these game experiences. What's yeah. cool? What's cool about that too is that it, as a as a designer, like some, I think sometimes when designers think about making games, we often think of it as like, well, we're we're going to observe the, the what's currently on screen and go, mm, yes, intellectually, I can understand that that has all the right properties that are going to cause these neurotransmitters to, mm, right? Yes, I see the thing, right? Um, <laughs> and that what, but what's cool about making games is that's not actually what you. That's not the best way to do it. The best way to do it is to like point your eyes at it poke at it and interact and then feel your brain work like yeah. it all it does it, it you feel it you're like uh, it won't Whoa. lie to you <laughs> i had that experience this more this morning i played a build and i'm like i'm like i can't hear what the, is happening in the meeting because it's so fun i just i'm so drawn in by this thing it's just incredible and i've seen like you know like so we 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 have this the, like i say it's deeply natural what we you know game design mm -hmm. is deeply natural it's like you know design when you're designing a chair it's easy to say can you sit on that chair and have it be comfortable like just sit down and mm -hmm. try it same with the game you know is it fun <laughs> well you play it is it fun right yeah no it's like creating the, a like game sounds don like falling norman. in love yeah yeah, yeah that's like exactly. the old don norman example yeah <laughs> um so, all right, so I wanted to ask about COVID topic. Um, so we're, you know, it's not over quite yet. We're returning to some kind of normalcy. Now we have a new variant. Everything's still somewhat upside down. But in terms of, Shrad, I wanted to throw this to you. Um, in terms of distinct differences between engaging ACPs pre-COVID and post-COVID, um, what do you see as the standout distinctions? Yeah, so for years and years, they were always talking about how telehealth was coming, telehealth was coming. And then when COVID hit, it was like telehealth is here. You have to figure it out in five minutes um, because you can't see your patient in person. You, you just have to figure out how to see them on the screen and make sure everything looks good. Um, and it's hard. I will be honest as a dermatologist. I mean, I, I'm used to t touching things and feeling things and strangely enough, smelling them too. And you can't do that through a screen. Um, only and pseudomonas, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> only yeah, that you can smell from a mile away. Yeah, exactly. But, it, it, <laughs> um, some of these um, these images, of course, we're getting all these digital images. And sometimes, as in Derm specifically, we are very good at identifying by images, but it's it, we're kind of out of practice because we're so used to doing it in person. We used to do it a lot when we were studying for boards and that sort of thing. So I think playing these games where we're getting these artistic renders and, and just seeing more of these um, these pictures of, of conditions is going to be very helpful, um, not only now, but even moving forward, because telehealth is here to stay. Um, and a lot of things are actually transitioning more to the digital world. I can say when I took my boards, um, I was probably one of the last year where we didn't, where we did have actual slides that we would look at under the microscope and and take a view and be able to identify Holy what it cow. is. The year Earth after garden. me, everything's digital. Yeah. yeah I know. Oh my God, it was terrible. Yeah. It's like fly down to Tampa, <laughs> there's your microscope. Oh, it doesn't, God. It doesn't work. <laughs> You're, it sucks to be you. Um, <laughs> you know, moving forward, it's digital. So you have to be able to identify these things digitally, um, and that's not changing. And I think that's that's how things are going to be moving forward. Um, and I think Level X mm -hmm. can really help a lot of HCPs, not only through the time of COVID, but just moving forward. Yeah. 
Yeah. Eric and I, and I'll add, add. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll add to that. You know, I think there were a lot of uh, Luddites and, and curmudgeons within the healthcare world that were like, I'm, I'm not even, I'm still paper charting. I won't go to an EMR ever. Um, and literally overnight, literally overnight mm -hmm. when telehealth uh, and COVID, uh, it was basically like you either adopt telehealth or you're not going to see patients and you're not going to be able to keep your practice going. And mm -hmm. faced with Absolutely. that decision, they adopted telehealth and technology. And I think that we'll look back to COVID-19 and see a few silver linings. And one of them will be the technology adoption. Um, and the other thing that we talk about was, you know, we don't even think about all the medical students, all the residents, that their, yeah. their uh, entire learning was based on experiential learning. And it all grinded yeah. to a halt. Either they were repurposed, some, some were actually graduated early, um, because they just, they were needed in New York. Um, they granted fourth year medical students uh, early graduation so that they could be on the front lines in the workforce. So, you know, think about the experiential learning and how that sort of turned the educational experience on its head. And one of the things that we'll see as a silver lining is the idea that instead of everything being synchronous and in person, we adopted this idea that things could be synchronous remote like we are right now and things can be asynchronous and i think one of the things that one of the smartest things that level x ever did um even pre-covid was the development was our remote play platform where you can actually access content and have multiple users within the same environment at the same time through oh, cool. teleconferencing and tele yeah so i mean it was one of the best things we ever did and it, we just our our team our cto andy glaser just way ahead of time sam our CEO just way ahead of the time. They just knew that this was going to be vital and important. And the I think the future, instead of all everything being synchronous, in-person, experiential, we're going to figure out what can be asynchronously done on your own time at night between patients, between cases, or what can be done synchronous remotely, right? You don't have to be in the hospital. You don't have to be in the conference. And what it has to be reserved for synchronous, in-person experiences. And that's one of the silver linings of COVID is the hybrid adoption of these different modalities. It sounds like that's going to open options up for so many more people to participate as well, right? Like people who might not be able to be in that place where that thing is actually happening. They can they can be in Beijing and they can be yeah. synchronous with New York or yeah. Imagine this conference awesome. if you know if this was in person and you couldn't fly to this conference, now you can experience this conference I, on your own time, you know, on your couch drinking coffee with your cat in your lap um, instead of yeah. having to fly and spend <laughs> the money, right? And so it's actually opening up experiences and increasing reach and increasing access to this type of stuff, which is exactly what telehealth did for medicine. Medicine going forward, assuming the reimbursement is going to stay the same for telehealth is we don't need to see every single patient in clinic for every single visit. There are things that we can do through telehealth results um, seeing, you know, some skin rashes you can you can actually do like there's things that I can do through telehealth and the future should be hybrid. Not everybody should come in to see the doctor and do the, the do the, you know, the travel and everything. That's one of the silver linings of COVID. Yeah. Yes. Um, I want to just uh, switch tracks for a second and talk some practicalities um, about actually working and collaborating with Level X. So let's say I'm a pharma company or an agency and I'm interested in creating something for my target audience. How do I go about doing that? What does that collaborative process look like? And I guess maybe if there's one thing that would make me go, okay, Level X is a must have as opposed to a nice to have. What would what would that be? You get to work with Jason and I. Come on, <laughs> and that's obviously aside from that. <laughs> so, so uh, I'll, I'll start, and I'll, I'll I'll throw it at Jason, Doctor Desai. But you know, I think one of the things, is, as far as the process is, is with any product development, anything that we're going to work with, um, there's a long process of intake. Really, we want to really understand the challenges you're having. We want to really understand where the knowledge gaps are. We want to really understand who we're going to be speaking to, what their base knowledge is. Remember, we talked a little bit about self determination theory, but adult learning learning theory is built off of um, self-determination theory and adult learning theory basically says like you have to respect people's prior knowledge you have to respect their experience you have to respect that they need to be learning something and know why they're learning it and they need to have something practical to do with that information and so through that lens we took we do large intake you know 
a big team meets with the team multiple, multiple, multiple times to really refine and figure out what that problem is. Once we define the problem, then the design team, which I'll let Jason talk about, take that problem and run with it. All along that process, we're working with our subject matter experts and any subject matter experts or KOLs that they might be working with to really um, reinforce the story, really test our theories, really well define what it is and build the parameters of what we're going to build. And then the design team gets this parameters and just runs with it. Uh, yeah, and then we I mean, we take take it from there. Um, so I, you know, it's a great and like, make magic happen. Yeah, make magic exactly. <laughs> yeah. Just like you know, we just, you know, we are we are wizards. We just do the wizard thing. Right? <laughs> um, uh, and I mean, the, the, there's a little bit of that. Like you, we do there. There is a, there's a great deal of creativity, and and we try to hire you know, people who are you know when you're hiring for designers. You know, you're looking for these bright sparks, right? You're looking for people who really have the can add the bzzz and then really under understand um, what joy is about and stuff. So, I mean, you know, when you're asking about like what what makes the the level X experience great, first, I mean, our our teams are are just bright and excited and enthusiastic. I mean, I, I keep telling friends in the because since I moved from from uh, big games to to um, medical, I keep asking, I keep telling friends, you guys, I'm working with every person I'm working with wants to make the world a better place mm. it's so <laughs> weird like i just don't even it's great like i love it um uh, and i know that i mean you know for for you know doctors and stuff it's that's you guys are like yeah but that's normal I mean, it's not normal that's not normal that's not... um <laughs> i love it i just love it um uh but also like like so so the teams are great and i like we really are are focused like like eric said we we really want to we love this problem of trying to figure out okay what are you trying to say what really are, what model are you trying to put inside your players heads like what do the doctors really need to know what's the key takeaway that we're going to try to reduce it down to this core experience but i think that the, the thing that really changed is different the thing that's really different in the end experience, the user experience between uh, um, the, the other stuff that I've seen and the, the the stuff that we make at Level X is is there's this is this moment where when we do play tests sometimes there's this moment where um, uh, uh, we'll bring in doctors and they'll we'll be playing even an early build of the game and they always start a little you know polite and a little bit like they you know they're worried that they're going to have to say nice things they're ready to say bad things right they're like right you're like hmm there's this tension right and which is great you want you want them coming in right like ready to fight if it sucks right um, but then there's this moment with our with our successful products there's this moment where they're like they go oh like they kind of go oh this is actually fun like you didn't mm -hmm. oh you were kidding this is actually <laughs> fun like i'm act, like and and they kind of or they don't look up, up right like they, yeah you're, they, totally they, don't even, they, say, they enter this flow state they don't even know the you're state. there asking questions yeah, and like, yeah oh sorry like, i was i was doing something <laughs> yeah sorry it was just kind of was just doing the thing right um and and what's weird is i mean that's all of our science, all of our learning, all of our skill is to is to is to trigger that state of wonder in in our players, mm -hmm. um, and to, and to trigger that state of wonder specifically around the thing that we're trying to teach them. Right? Here's this here's this piece of information about this new this new drug or this new medical device, whatever it is that we're doing, um, and so that 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 moment of like when their heart, it's like their heart opens. There's a trust that comes along with a with a with a, when a player. Um, it gets a genuine positive experience from a piece of software that you've made. There's a trust that comes along with it that means that, again, like we were talking about, they'll buy the sequel, right? Like this, yeah. if you're actually really providing value, right? Then the next time they, that, they, that they hear, you're like, oh, you got one of those level X MOA things? Cool, I want to try it. I like that last one, right? Um, mm -hmm. And it's a virtuous cycle because then we have set the expectation that they're always going to have a good time with it, right? Like it's so we have to keep making them great, right? They have to be great, uh, um, and, and as long as we do that, then we stay in this virtuous relationship with with the uh, with the doctors where they're actually excited. Like you know, Shraddha, you were you were saying, you know, I, send me a journal, please. No, oh god, right? <laughs> like this, like that is not a great relationship with the publisher right you're not in a you know healthy yeah. positive like you need that information but it's not great right um whereas so that so the level x difference i think really is for, but one statistically they'll retain it better just across the board people will remember it better so that's great but also over the long haul our whole goal is to help doctors get us regain their sense of excitement towards learning Right to to, mm -hmm. to that that when when we're when and we want our our um, our clients and we want uh, the people that we're that we're making these games for to be able to say to be able to come to us knowing that they're gonna 
create a delightful experience in in in, the, in that ed education, right? Um, which is you know good for everybody, right? But then the third outcome of that is that it's a lot faster. <laughs> like it's we talk about respecting doctors' time, right? Um, yeah. If if we could, if we can, in ten seconds, get them to go, oh, cool. Then suddenly they're going to get those next five minutes they spend with the game are so much more efficient than the five minutes you're going to spend skimming through the yeah, oh, just burning stuff, through yeah. and then try, trying yeah. to highlight yeah. it's this and oh, I get it where the thing is <laughs> right. It's it's so much more efficient to, to to do the learning. So it's it's you know when all the pieces come together. Um, uh, it can it, it can kind of produce magic, um, and that's the that's the goal. So we're and we're hoping we're hoping to you know like <laughs> spawn a bunch of competitors. Like we're looking forward to a future yeah. where you know like yeah. we're we're fighting it out with other people who are making even more software because it would love I would love and you know in in a, in a hundred years I'd love this to be the the way that learning is done. You yeah. Know, or in ten yeah. years, create creating a genre. Well, I think yeah, I mean that's yeah. Go ahead, Deborah. No, Shrada kind of touched on that, oh, you know, like this is yeah. this is the wave. This is telemedicine is, isn't maybe here to stay, maybe not. Like it's here to stay and then some. So I, I just try to want to give you a, a chance to comment on that. Uh, the last question, but I also wanted to ask you about how Level X leverages the HCP experience around interactions with pharma, because I think that's something probably a lot of people are curious about. Yeah, so as someone who's a player as well as a physician, um, one thing I love about Level X is they're constantly updating their content. It's not like, oh, this content is like five years old. It's it's updating on a regular basis. And as we know, you know, pharma has um, probably the most up-to-date and accurate studies and, you know, reports about their products. And before, we either get those from reps, which unfortunately can't come to our office um, still. Um, now they just send stuff in the mail and I sit there and I'm like, I don't know how to decipher this <laughs> or I don't have the time. Um, or um, we contact the medical director if we're having a lot of trouble and, and request white papers from them. I think this might be a nice area where they can work together with Level X and, you know, give the most up to date content directly onto this um, game so that we have access to that as physicians and players. Um, mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you want everybody educated, but you also want everyone to be educated correctly, <laughs> if that makes sense. Right. Um, with the best knowledge. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's a, a good role for for pharma and um, for Level X together. And plus everything's at the tip of your hands. You know, I don't have to lug around yeah. like all of my journals or my papers or skim through all these things. It's all in my phone, which I use on a second by second basis. Yeah, and I think it's important what you said to get the right information, right? So we all know right. there's so much disinformation out there. So it's the one place you know you can go and you can trust. Um, yeah. uh, so I, we wanted to leave some time for questions. I feel like we could just talk forever, but let me just, <laughs> let me just, uh, we did have some questions come in. So let me, um, let me see what, let me see what the, the audience has to say out there. Um, so this is not directed to any specific person. Um, somebody asks, can you share any specifics around the amount of engagement you see with the experiences that you build? Curious about the data collection process and expectations as well. Do you share data aggregated or down to the individual? I can, I can answer the first part of that and I'll have Jason answer the second part. So <laughs> we'll try um, to. The, we'll try to, yeah. So, you know, uh, as far guys. as, exactly. Um, as far as engagement numbers, you know, we shared a little bit early on that we have over 750,000 healthcare professionals playing our games across, you know, our five main games. So, you know, obviously we're adding new audiences every day. And, you know, Shrada talked about, you know, the content that we add on a regular basis is not only to get, uh, you know, the players that are already playing to give more content and more stuff to play around with, but also have let new players that, hey, we're, we're bringing in new content. This is a different way to, to engage with our, with this content. Um, um, and so I think that's a really, really fantastic thing about everything that we build 
as far as the data collection process, so obviously when you're on a software-based solution, there's going to be tons of data that gets collected and games are no different, which is one advantage over you giving somebody a PDF is you actually get to see how they interact with it. And the idea that people can actually make genuine decisions and do what they would do in practice in a simulated environment, you can collect all those decision points is huge. We use a lot of that internally to help improve our games. If we'll see people are making something making a mistake somewhere, we won't just say, ha ha, you did it wrong. We'll say, hey, you know what? This seems too hard for them. Let's retool that. And we've done that with lots of our games where there was like one thing that was sort of off where people were sort of confused and we could see it in the data and they just totally retooled those levels within the game. As far as what we share, you know, that we do have obviously aggregate data. All of our stuff is used internally. And then if we have a client or partner project that is specific, we'll release some of that data. Uh, Jason, do you want to talk a little bit more about data? Yeah, um, yeah. Like I say, like when we're working with clients, we really, we really focus down on like just what do they want to know, um, what's the key thing, because it, it, we want to make sure that our that our clients are always getting exactly the data that 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 that, that will confirm you know the, the outcomes that they're looking for. That's the that's the whole the holy grail. What's nice too is that like like Eric is saying, the games industry went through this thing about ten years ago where where we went from, you know we just kind of throw it out there and, and hope um, to, well, we can just literally measure everything, right? Um, uh, and so we, we have a, a, a data analytics group, you know, uh, par excellence, um, and I love working with them. And so we, we do we do um, a sort of extensive data collection. And of course, the trick with data collection is always to to turn your heap, your huge mountain of data into two or three key points that actually are revealing, right? And so that's the process. The process that we really go through is one of analysis and making sure that we're picking the right KPIs um, along the way. Um, and that that's a that's an open pipeline between us and our clients. Um, like I say, uh, 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 publicly, I think we, we're it's a it, I'm not sure what we share out there, but um, we're 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 all always about uh, making sure that people are getting what they need to hear, what 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 they're you know seeing the inside of the machine. I love that aspect of game development. Like we were just in top, we were we're looking at the numbers for Top Term now, right? As Top Term comes in, and we're just, we're seeing where you know oh this is we can see which question people you know which questions people like the most and which ones you know are you know the least popular, and we can just go oh this is interesting. He's like, it's, it's, you, can, you can look inside the mind of your players from the inside of these, yeah. with these control panels. It's fantastic. It's so cool. What I also like about um, that is that we, as players, um, actually comment or, or say, like, if we disagree with one of those questions or we're like, hey, this is worded a little strangely, we have the ability to reach out to level up um, through that same game and have them actually work with some of our advisors to fix those questions or update those questions. So I, I love that you're more than just a player, you are really participating in the development of the yeah. game too. Mm -hmm. That's, th that is, yeah. that is, um, we, we had with, with Top Derm, we introduce, we have for each question, you can do a little leave feedback, like you can just go right in the game, yeah. you can tap that thing, right? Um, uh, I, coming from the games industry, and you know, we, we would do that when we were when we were doing with regular games, and we would see normal response rates. You know, that were like you know two percent, four percent of people are going to reply, right? Something like that. It, it was like three quarters of our alpha test. It's, it's absurd. What I've learned: yeah. doctors want to share their opinions with us, and <laughs> bless you. Oh my God, so good. I love that. I we have this. We have this. We have a Slack channel that's just the inflow of comments from the top <laughs> derm, right? We just we love to go through it. It's fantastic. So, so it's a really I love I love that direct contact. Um, you know, direct. I would just say you can be direct. You know, we respect that. You know. <laughs> It's a cool <laughs> symbiotic relationship. Then your users right. feel like they're actually also creating the game with you in a way. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. No, and, then, and they literally are like they, you know, they go. They, yeah. we, we have some 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 people will be like, literally right on their phone. Well, you know, this question is accurate in most cases, but you've overlooked a case where there's level of like, <laughs> wow, thanks, Doc. That's very cool. Um, all right, let's see. We have another question here. Uh, any plans to develop games with medical fidelity slash accuracy with game mechanics aimed at a wider audience? Uh, Good question. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, a lot of our games were built on sort of the idea that uh, video games bring this in 
like massive technical expertise. And that technical expertise was actually to build physics models. Instead of just watching some kind of video or PowerPoint, all of our stuff is actually interactive. So you actually can interact in a genuine manner and there's actually physics that are running and determining. Nothing is already determined, nothing is pre-programmed. Your interaction with the, uh, with the actual game is what dictates what happens. And so we have lots of different physics. We have our own fluid sim that actually got built we have our old blood sim, our blood mixing sim. We have lots of different real-time simulators that are running on a cell phone. Um, Sam always likes to say the thing that drops your calls runs a real-time physics simulator um, <laughs> within our games. And so we can do a whole bunch of different game mechanics. And the physics that we build in are actually based on real physics. So we have mucus tech that actually was built on real mucus. We have x-ray wavelength light passing through human models. And that was actually built off of the idea that you can actually quantify the light that passes through what gets refracted you know yeah. all the different technologies that we build is all built on these physics engines yeah i would also say too like i think the question too is also asking like you know are there you know do we want to go for games that are that have that that capture you know more gamers that are interested in healthcare right um, yeah and i i mean what i would say is we are at the beginning of a very long journey it, we we do not suffer for having interesting problems to try to take tackle right now like you know come on board if you want to help like so you know gen generally i i would i would love i mean you know i come from the games industry and that was part of our my early conversations was there is there a way to do this it's 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 crucial that the experiences that we build for doctors um maintain that credibility right that it actually be medically med medically credible and, and relevant um and we we're 100 percent focused on that um and then I think I would love to be in the future working on ideas to see about how we can share that relevancy, share that credibility with a broader audience in a way that doesn't water down the experience. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. We've actually made some consumer level games early on. Well, you know, as part of the American Heart Association, we actually made a CPR app for lay people. So I think there's a lot of companies that have come and approached us for actually lay people audiences to like, hey, how do I understand or how do I explain this surgery or this condition to my patients? You know, I think that's maybe hopefully, you know, something in the future that, you know, we maybe we would engage with and be interesting to, to explore. Yeah. Um, all right, I think we have time for one more question. Can you share any more information about your mechanism of action solution coming out soon that we mentioned at the very top of the event? Well, I mean, speaking of the speaking of the the, the accessible, you know, mechanics. So, um, what we're what we're working on is a, a behind the scenes is a is a new new game type based on um, you know the, the 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 these physics puzzle games, right? That that, that proliferate across the, 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 the world, hundreds of millions of, of, of players, huge industry. Like they're very very comfortable and accessible. So what we're doing is we're taking those sort of I've got a physics sandbox. Um, mechanics and we're applying them to the MOA problem to create this sort of a, you know, a, a, a say call it a, a delightful petri dish experience where the instead of the doctor being told, this is how you, this is how this works, see, and then you have to think about it. We're like, we're like, these are the components of this molecule. This is the components of this drug. Here's the con context that it's in knock yourself out like how you to play around and sort of be the chemical god right um is sort of the 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 point and it's um you know it's all focused on delight and and fun like it, it on, the, on the one hand it's it's for conveying information but it's also like as, as always our goal is that when you touch the screen you're like oh, okay this is really cool like i'm this is yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, it's exciting the one thing I'll add forward to sharing more. yeah go ahead deborah go ahead no, I just I just love the word delight in in terms yes. of anything medical and learning and studying. Right. It's usually just this doldrums, like you said, big, thick journal or book. So why can't learning something as important and literally life or death as medicine? Why can't it be a delight? I like I like the way that Jason put it that we're trying to bring the excitement back into lifelong learning. Um, you know, because I think one of the things that I, I'd like to hear Dr. Desai's take on it too. But you know, you know, one of the big discussions we had for a long time was dermatologists and biologics. And one of the things that we started yeah. to hear was that there's a lot of dermatologists that will not prescribe biologics because they're not comfortable, they don't understand it, and really understanding. Mm -hmm. I think dermatologists know better than most about the mechanism of disease, right? So they know how psoriasis 
focused on a molecular level works, but they weren't comfortable with understanding how a the mechanism of action of one of these biologics was. It's like, I don't know what IL it is. I don't know if it's 23, if it's 17, mm -hmm. it's IL-6. Like, I don't know which one this is. What does it mean if it's doing 17 and 23? What does it mean if this? And so when we started to hear this sort of feedback from physicians that there were people who were uncomfortable prescribing biologics because they didn't understand yeah. the mechanism of action very well, this is where this product really came in and really can make a difference. And I definitely agree with that. I, I actually, for three years, did nothing but re um, research in psoriasis. And I thought I knew everything about every biologic. Now, this was years ago. So all we had was like Humira and Enbro and, and, you know, Stolora. That was the big one that came out. And, you know, there's so many new ones. Like you said, there's IL-17, IL-17 and 23. And you're right. It, it gets confusing as to like, yeah, I can I can cite which one's which, but how does it actually work? What part of the cascade is it stopping? What's it doing? And most of us, whether we're in dermatology or not, we are visual learners. So having that interactive, um, you know, mechanism of action there, that's so much more helpful than me looking at an immunology book being like, okay, well, I see like the triangle connects to this little other piece over here. Th this is this is going to stick with my mind. This, I'm going to remember this Pac -Man it. Pac-Man looking thing. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> so I think, I, I think awesome. for a lot of people, whether you're in Durham or not, will be helpful. Yeah, um, this is so fascinating. I'm super sad that we are out of time already. <laughs> um, so thank you all for a wonderful presentation and Q&A session. Um, on behalf of MM and M, I want to thank Level X for today's webcast. A big thank you to Eric, Jason, and Shrada for sharing their insights. And of course, to all of you, our audience out there, for tuning in and participating. Today's webcast will be available on demand on the MM and M website under the events forward slash webcast tab for up to one year. So you can revisit it. Uh, you can tell others about it who weren't able to make it today. And uh, that's it for us. Once again, thank you, everyone. And we hope you're staying safe. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.